All right, so you could just forget any idea of a gentle postseason lull. Oh, none of that. Forget those traditional young driver outings. Abu Dhabi, it was supposed to be the curtain call. Yep. But instead, it became ground zero for the 2026 technical revolution. It really did. We saw 10 teams, 25 drivers, and just a whole arsenal of secrets being tested right there on track. Mm. This was not a test. This was a high-stakes collision with the future. Yep. We are diving into the definitive secrets of the first collective 2026 run, and we're going straight into the DRS zone. You absolutely hit the nail on the head there. This was a defining moment. It was not, you know, a normal postseason jolly. Not at all. The 10 current teams, they stayed behind specifically to deploy their mule cars. Right, these sort of compromised test platforms. Exactly. And their mission was crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Simulate future downforce levels, get a feel for the definitive 2026 tires from Pirelli. The ones they've signed off on? The very ones. And crucially, test those uh, curious experimental items. Which turned out to be the active aero concepts. Of course. So this collective data haul is just exponentially more valuable than any private testing. It was the first brutal glimpse of what's coming. Okay, so let's unpack who was actually in the thick of it. The quality of the roster alone tells you how serious this was. It does. 25 drivers on track. 15 of them are confirmed race drivers for next year. These are the guys who can give you that immediate real-world feedback. Exactly. And the future was front and center. You had Isa Kajar getting settled into his new Red Bull cockpit. Getting comfortable. And right there, his successor at Racing Bulls, Arvid Limblad, the confirmed F1 rookie, taking his first serious steps. They were learning the language of a future car. The roster was impressive, no doubt. But for me, the most significant story wasn't who was there. It was who wasn't. It was who was strategically, and I have to say, unfortunately, locked out. You're talking about the elephant in the pit lane. I'm talking about Cadillac. Cadillac and their drivers, conspicuous by their complete absence. And this is where the, uh, the operational rules of F1 just become a strategic nightmare for a new team. So why? Why couldn't they be there? Because this specific test is formally part of the current season's post-race running. Ah, uh, the legal constraint. Precisely. That rule meant they were barred from bringing the 2023 Ferrari they've been using for their private testing. I get the rule book, but is missing one test, even a collective one, really a catastrophic blow? I mean, isn't that maybe overstating the setback a little? No, it's absolutely massive. And here's why. All 10 of the established teams are now processing the first set of collective data on the definitive 2026 tires. The construction, the compounds, everything. Everything. Load sensitivity, active error response. Cadillac has missed out on correlating any of that real-world feedback with their own virtual models. So they're flying blind. In a sport where you win or lose years in advance, missing that collective baseline, especially on tires, is a serious, serious disadvantage. This segment is part of our news coverage of recent F1 events. Mm -hmm. Right. If that's the strategic backdrop, let's talk pure engineering speed, because this is where it gets really, really interesting. The active aero showdown. Yes. This wasn't just about tires. This is about testing the single most radical concept of the new regulations. That's the heart of the 2026 rules, isn't it? Active aero on both the front and rear wing. For that massive drag reduction. Exactly. A low downforce mode that drivers will be engaging constantly. But since the mule cars are old chassis, they had to, you know, approximate the effect. And how do you approximate a revolution like that? Aggressively. They ran Monza spec wings, so the lowest downforce available. Okay. And crucially, they were allowed to use the rear wing DRS outside the normal zones. But the real focus, the engineering star of the show, was simulating that movable front wing. So the FIA let them develop a prototype system for that. They did. Yeah. Just to reduce the angle of attack on that uppermost element, get that initial data on drag reduction and how it changes tire loads. And what we got was a direct head-to-head -head engineering comparison. Mercedes versus Ferrari. Who had the cleaner idea for a movable wing. And the difference in approach, I mean, it just speaks volumes about their design philosophies right now. Wait, what? Mercedes, on Kimi Antonelli's car, it looked like a textbook prototype. How so? We're talking an actuation system connected via large, very visible tubing. You could see it feeding back into the nose cone. It looked robust, maybe a bit heavy. A pure function over form test rig. So Mercedes came with the industrial strength version, the one that says we just need the data even if it looks crude. Precisely. Data capture efficiency was the priority. 
Now you compare that to Ferrari. A different story. Oh, completely different story. Visibly, dramatically more refined. You can tell they'd already worked on this in private. What did they do? Their actuator was connected by a really sleek, subtle carbon stem. It was tucked neatly behind the wing, feeding discreetly under the nose. That suggests Ferrari is already thinking about the integration, the drag consequences of the system itself. They are. But is that always the best way to go? I mean, isn't there a risk that by making it so subtle, it might not be robust enough for the real 2026 loads? Well, that is the essential trade-off right now, isn't it? Ferrari is trying to minimize the aero penalty of the mechanism. Mercedes seems to want maximum power and reliability in the actuator, even if it adds temporary drag. And they know these are just phase one anyway. Exactly. The final rules will give them a choice, hydraulic or electric actuators, one or two wing elements. This was just the opening mm. shot. That attention to detail is just captivating. But here's the thing. To make any of this data useful, the FIA had to step in and put a massive artificial choke collar on the rest of the field. Mm -hmm. Let's pivot to the secret speed limit. Tell us about this critical 300 kilometer hour wall. Right. This is where using old chassis to test new rules becomes, well, glaringly obvious. A strict 300 kilometer hertz speed limit was imposed on the standard mule cars, a hard limit. But you said Ferrari and Mercedes weren't restricted when they ran their experimental wings. Why the exception for them? That's the key advantage they got. Yeah. The limit existed for everyone else because of basic physics. Going. On these ground effect cars, if you only activate the rear wing DRS at high speed, you create this severe disproportionate load increase on the front axle. Why is that? Because the ground effect is pulling the whole car down aggressively with speed. Yeah. You suddenly remove the rear component and you get a massive aerodynamic imbalance. So the car becomes violently front heavy over 300 kilometers. You risk overloading the front tires and then the data Pirelli needs is totally useless. You've got it. The 300 kilometer rate limit was uh, probably the biggest artificial fudge factor in F1 history, engineered simply to balance the car. And Ferrari and Mercedes with their simulated active front wings were closer to the true 2026 scenario where both wings open. So their car was more balanced, hence no restriction. This whole issue ties directly into tire management. We know on huge straights like Baku, tire temps can drop over 30 degrees Celsius. A massive cooling shock. How did running this compromised test help Pirelli prepare for that cooling effect, which is only going to get worse in 2026? That's a great question, and it really gets to the viability of the whole test. That temperature drop will be even more pronounced with full active aero. Ooh, what did they learn? The speed-restricted test provided a safe environment. They could sample the 2026 construction and compounds without literally blowing out tires from that front overload. Pirelli's director, Mario Isola, he was clear. The test was useful, but he stressed it was actually more important for the teams. More important for the teams to do what, specifically? To sample that final construction and, crucially, to correlate that real-world performance with the virtual tire models Pirelli gives them. Right. Without this, their simulator work is just guesswork. They'd be running blind. And you have to remember, the 2026 tires are narrower. It's a complete redesign, not just a scale down. This test was vital to understand that new contact patch. If you're watching this on YouTube, welcome to DRS Zone. Don't forget to subscribe for more F1 content. Okay, we've talked aero success, we've talked speed compromises. Now we have to deliver the cold, harsh reality check on these mule cars. Mm -hmm. Because these machines, as useful as they were, were just a best possible approximation. I mean, let's be blunt about it. You have to temper the excitement with the performance data or you miss the whole point. So let's quantify it. Let's do it. Kimi Antonelli's fastest time in the Mercedes mule car was a 1.25.170. Right. That was 1.4 seconds slower than the fastest time of the week, which was Jack Crawford in a standard non-mule 2025 Aston Martin. A 1.4 second gap to a normal test car. That is staggering. And it gets worse. You compare it to the competitive race pace, the average performance deficit across all 10 teams compared to race week on qualifying was 3.93 seconds. Nearly four seconds. Nearly four seconds off the pace. These cars weren't just slow, they were in a completely different performance category. And this brings us to the biggest flaw, the fundamental disconnect that makes James Val's critique completely understandable. They were four seconds off, but they were also missing the most crucial element of the entire 2026 change. That is the structural failure of the whole concept. These mule cars were using the outgoing power units. Which means the drivers couldn't practice the single most defining challenge of the new rules. Exactly. Managing the radically new energy recovery systems, modifying their driving to maximize harvesting, 
all of that was completely off the table. The entire 2026 formula is built around strategic energy deployment. If you can't test that, what is the driver really learning? That's it. The engineers got tire data, but the drivers missed the core learning experience. It's why James Valls at Williams was so forceful. He said the mule cars are, and I quote, just too far away to give a clear read on 2026. And he stressed that the real work has to be done in the simulator. Almost exclusively in the simulator now. Why though? Why is the sim suddenly the primary battleground? Because the aero balance, the ride heights, the mechanical grip of these mule cars, it will never truly represent the final 2026 chassis. It's just too different. So the test gave them data to plug in. Invaluable tire data to plug into the matrix, yes. But the performance output of the car is fundamentally flawed by the missing power unit. It just confirms that the virtual world is the only place the 2026 design war can actually be won. So we've tracked this from Ferrari's subtle arrow to the compromised physics of that 300 kilometer limit. The teams got invaluable real-world data, but the truth is the car itself was deeply structurally flawed. It leaves us with a pretty powerful reflection, doesn't it? It does. Given that the drivers couldn't test the new power unit recovery strategies, the strategic core of 2026, and the cars were running almost four seconds off the pace, how much is this early data truly going to shape the final concepts? Or was it just a billion dollar tire modeling exercise? Exactly. Was this test just confirming that the simulator is now the only true battleground left? That's the question you should be mulling over as this revolution accelerates. We've given you the knowledge, we've cut through the noise, drilled down on the secrets of the first 2026 collective test. Now you have the advantage. Don't miss a single beat of the action because the engineering war is already underway. Follow the DRS Zone on all platforms, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll see you at the checkered flag.